it's interesting traveling for me because I, I think it's as a monk or maybe it's just my own comma, but I have a very high ratio of getting sat next to people trying to convert me to a different religion. Uh, I think monks are worth extra points, maybe. And it's led to some interesting conversations around truth. And uh, just this last week, someone emailed in a moment of sincere crisis in her faith, asking how, when she had doubts in this teaching, what could sustain her as she moved on through this path, what she could take as a foundation in the midst of this storm. And luckily, the Buddha gave us an answer for this. It hasn't worked on the planes, but I think it is a relevant way of looking to the Buddhist conception of truth. And uh, if Buddhism is true, why it's true? Why our faith has grounding? And what the Buddha meant when he spoke about that. So there's a sutta, which many of you might know, even those who haven't read many of the suttas, this might be one of the few ones you've seen quoted, called the Kalama Sutta in the Nguttara Nikaya. And uh, the Buddha is approached by a group of lay um, practitioners or uh, villagers who say that they've been approached by various samanas, ascetics, contemplatives, teaching this and that, and they don't know what to do. They don't know which one to believe. And what's very beautiful is instead of saying, well, you should, you should believe me, you know, like you would think some would, the Buddha says, it is fitting, Kalamas, that doubt has arisen for you. Doubt has arisen in regards to an a issue worthy of doubt. And specifically, the Kalamas were speaking about um, belief in, in various points of, of doctrine, including, including rebirth and other things. And... The Buddha goes on to say, uh, do not go by hearsay, by lineage of teaching, by collection of scriptures, by logical reasoning, by reasoning by analogy, by reasoned reflection, by competence of the speaker, or because you have the thought, this is our teacher. But s instead, Kalamas, when you see for yourselves these qualities are unskillful, blameworthy, criticized by the wise, or criticized by the wise, leading to long-term suffering, then you should abandon them. And kalamas, when you see that these qualities are wholesome, praised by the wise, uh, blameless, leading to long-term welfare and benefit, then you should adopt them. And what's so... Uh, Profound. What, what you will have seen quoted often is just that part about not uh, believing in teachers. Um, I believe this has been quoted as, uh, uh, don't believe anything anyone says, including me, just go by your own reasoning, and uh, similar phrases. But the criteria the Buddha gives is actually broader, and there's a lot in this sutta. First of all, there's this uh, acknowledgement as he kind of rips apart every foundation we usually place our beliefs on. And something in us really wants an irrefutable ground of belief, something that is unshakable, which I think is the reason for the proclivity of so many of us to take a group of scriptures or a book or a teacher and invest our entire hearts in it. And this has made its way into the scientific realm as well. There was a, an attempt at the early, in the early 1900s by a mathematician, or actually I think it was about three of them, to create a mathematical language for everything. Um, and uh, I think after 800 pages, it was like a five volume set, and after 800 pages, there's this long line of equation, and uh, it means one plus one equals two. And then there's this dry acknowledgement right below it that this equation is sometimes useful. So 
So there's this attempt to systematize and prove everything in terms of mathematics. And then this, I believe he was from the Netherlands, his name was Godel, and he came across uh, a few years later, and he brought into public awareness two theorems that he created called Godel's incompleteness theorems. And they're systematic proofs that any self-consistent uh, system of mathematics, any system uh, sort of robust enough to use logic and logarithms within, uh, cannot prove all of its axioms. And that's profound, because what it means is no matter how convincing of an edifice we build on top of things, there's always, inevitably, uh, a priori assumptions and uh, something that we're taking for granted that is not provable within the system, but is still real. And what's beautiful in this is that the Buddha seems to acknowledge this in this sutta and in his teachings. Instead of saying, look, I am uh, divine, every word is uh, truth that should be taken without examination, or without saying, like, this body of scripture is um, this. And, and obviously the Buddha said he only spoke truth, but he encouraged investigation, and the criteria he gives in that sutta is a wide variety of means that we can bring to bear to try to verify if something's true. And it's a quote-unquote good enough approach. Can we bring these different means of verifying truth uh, all into our minds and hearts and practice such that we can get good enough of an idea? Because in the end, that, that is what we are, have access to. Um, what's good enough? So in terms of dealing with this inevitable doubt that arises when we uh, are faced with this changing and confusing world, um, the Buddha not only uh, does a few things. Um, one is he constrains the realm of truth in Buddhism to what is relevant, what is meaningful to our paths now. And this can be seen in a few things. The word dhamma, um, as in what he says in the Kalama Suttas, when you see these dhammas, these qualities are wholesome, praised by the wise, blameless, uh, leading to long-term welfare. Dhamma means truth, it means teaching, and it means quality. So this aspect of what our practice is, how we act, and what we believe, these two are intertwined in the Buddhist path. And you see this restraint everywhere in the Buddhist teaching is instead of getting lost in these uh, ontological systems or vast uh, hypotheses about the world, the Buddha gives us what is essential to relieving suffering and finding peace. Many of you will know the sutta where he's sitting in the grove and he picks up a handful of leaves and says, bhikkhus, what is more, these leaves in my hand are the leaves in the grove. And the bhikkhus are like, all right, this is an easy one. So the hands in your leaves, Lord. And the Buddha says, even so, that which, wi which I have known through direct knowledge is like the leaves in the grove. That which I teach is just the leaves in my hand. Suffering and the end of suffering. So, in response to the Kalamas, confusion, the Buddha points to their own experience in their hearts, something they can verify for themselves that is meaningful and applicable. He steers them away from a group of existential questions and says, what is blameless? What is wholesome? What is praised by the wise? Uh, what, when practice, leads to your long-term benefit and welfare? And the thing is, that is an admixture of reliance on others and reliance on yourself. Yes, you uh, need to put into practice teachings in your life and see what leads to benefit, see what is blameless, what feels wholesome in your heart. But you also need to find beings you consider wise and uh, go to them for teachings. And neither of those is perfect. Sometimes you think someone's wise and they're not. 
Sometimes you think you intuitively know what the right path is, but you don't. But as we practice, um, as you bring these two things together, we find that we stumble closer and closer to the truth and the goal of cleansing the heart, which all Buddhist truth is oriented around. It's all around the goal of enlightenment. So there's a few really practical means there in the Kalama Sutta. Um, one is uh, when you know for yourselves, Kalamas, what is wholesome and unwholesome. Um, what is or what is uh, unwholesome? Uh, what is blameworthy? What is censured by the wise? What, when you practice, it leads to your suffering in the long term? There's a few really practical ways of bringing these to bear right now. So be because this isn't an abstract question, these questions of truth have to do with our lives right now. What is the core of our uh, life and what when we scrape away all the illusion and delusion rests at the core of what we know to be most meaningful because that alignment with truth is uh, something we sense in our lives or sense out of kilter with our lives and the thing about truth um, Ajahn Panyavado says that suffering dukkha is when we are trying to push down something we deeply know in our hearts like a ping pong ball underneath water, constantly trying to rise up, and dukkha is constantly trying to push it down again so it doesn't come up. So what, you know, and, and at its core, this is, there's a sutta where the Buddha says, um, one knows this is suffering, and this is the cessation of suffering. It is to this extent I declare right view. So there is a broad scope of white, right view that the Buddha talks about in terms of acknowledging kama, in terms of acknowledging what's um, our karmic debts, our role in the world. But there's a transcendent right view, which is this simple. This is the most fundamental seed of truth in the Buddhist teaching. What is suffering and what is the release from suffering? So this is a useful metric because that sensation of dukkha, suffering is not an adequate translation. It's more than that. It can be a sense of uh, disturbance, of constantly trying to push something away, of a slight nausea as you know that your life isn't quite aligned with the truth it should be aligned with. All these are suffering. And those are metrics you can feel in your body in regards not just to a teaching at large or a collection of scriptures, but right now is the way you're interacting with your uh, spouse correct in line with truth, in line with Dhamma? Is the career you're in making you weak or is it in line with truth and the deepest purpose you know you're meant for? This is Buddhist truth, peace and dukkha. So when the Buddha says what is for my long-term benefit, it's useful to think uh, when you're in the midst of a doubt, um, what is the best action next uh, in my life? What uh, should I stick with this job, et cetera? Really thinking 20 years down the road, um, think in the long term, what will you regret not having tried, not having done? Um, similarly, with the sense of wholesome and unwholesome, um, blameworthy and blameless, this often is that sense in the heart right now of what feels full of suffering and what feels full of peace. And what's interesting is when we face situations and doubts where the vista of our life extends outward and it's a really confusing situation, maybe it's a enormous decision involving many people, maybe it's something we just, there's too many conditions to wrap our heads around. Ironically, that's often when you need to come right back to that sensation of the heart. What feels, what's your intention? What feels strong? Because if you make a decision that's based on courage and strength, even if it goes wrong, you will never regret it. Not, not making it, but the one that makes you weak, makes you feel that, you will. And ironically, when things get most confusing, it's often when we have to turn our attention even more towards that, uh, 
counterintuitively to what feels wholesome and unwholesome, blameworthy and blameless right here in your heart. It's a bit like when seas are calm, you can stretch your gaze out to the horizon and look at the wide vista. You can see things fairly clearly and logic decisions out. But when seas get stormy, sometimes the waves are so large, all you can do is make sure your rudder is pointed into the next wave. And that means your rudder is just that sense of suffering, wholesomeness, uh, suffering or not suffering, blameworthy or blamelessness in your heart. And there's a, a I interesting phrase in many of the suttas where the Buddha says, one encounters truth with the body and penetrates to wisdom. And it seems like many teachers haven't really known quite what to make of that word body in that context, encountering truth with the body, what does that mean? And many even leave it out of translation. But for the sake of this talk, I think there's a useful resonance there in that understanding that these deep recognitions of the right direction in life often come from the body. Um, so really acknowledging that our bodies have a deep pattern recognition that our minds, our conscious minds do not have. So if you are having a feeling of was acting in a certain way correct or not, um, what was true and wholesome about that act, feel afterwards, how does it feel in your body? Do you feel a residue? If you're worried about going, you know, if your livelihood is correct or if a relationship is correct, do you feel weak? Is there a disintegration as you go to that job, as you enter the relationship? What do you feel in your body? You can actually use this in meditation. You can visualize two options in front of you and just turn your body towards each and feel if there's a resonance. There's also a, a monk in Japan who, if uh, in terms of getting rid of things towards a minimalism, he'll take an object and he'll hold it to his heart. And if it sparks joy, then he'll keep it. But if it creates this sense of weakening in the body, he knows that he should get rid of it. And Ayananda Bodhi has a really powerful practice where actually she'll set up two cushions across from each other and she'll sit on one cushion as her mind and write a letter to her body. And then she'll get up and sit on the other cushion as her body and write a letter back to the mind. So these are play acting in a certain way, but the body has an intuitive knowledge that our conscious mind does not have. And sometimes that's actually a really useful metric. Um, they did a study where they showed participants a series of numbers that all shared uh, a certain um, quality, or I, I think it's like a certain number of odd numbers next to each other or something. And then they quickly flashed those set of numbers with another random set all mixed together. And people could say, okay, that, that number belongs with the old set, that number belongs with the old set, but they couldn't say why. All to say that our conscious minds don't understand the whole pattern recognition of our intuition and body. And this is why it's so helpful to sometimes come to it. And it's also the importance of cultivating breath meditation, this learning to come into contact again with our body and gain that compass. So this is what the Kalama Sutta gives us is, it says we can't go alone by each of these things, reasoning, a teacher, etc. But we take these other factors and assume that they are good enough as a working hypothesis. And that's Buddhist faith. Can we take this as a working hypothesis that we are capable of change and purifying the heart? There's a sutta called the Chanki Sutta where a really, uh, he's quite an aggressive uh, Brahmin is debating the Buddha. And the Buddha says, look, there are five things that can turn out different ways in the here and now. Either you buy into a teaching because you approve of it, because of an unbroken lineage, because of reasoning by analogy, because of acceptance through pondering views, and faith. But each of those things is not for sure, and it is not right to say, after having faith or because one has a certain lineage, etc., only this is true, everything else is false. And Bharadvaja asks, how do we protect truth? And the Buddha says, when you have faith, you say, I have faith. When you have 
an unbroken lineage of teachings, you say, this is why I believe I have an unbroken lineage of teachings. But you don't yet say, only this is true, everything else is false. And this is the secret to world peace. Basically, we all just get together and say, yeah, we don't really know. We kind of have faith in this, but it's just faith. Who knows? You know, it's a working hypothesis. But the Buddha says, eventually, there is awakening to truth. And that happens when one finds a teacher, approaches them, strives, and at the end, realizes truth with this body and penetrates to wisdom. Because the one thing that is unshakable knowledge is that of deliverance. And to be honest, that's the core, that's the core knowledge that the truth of which everything else is aimed towards and grounded upon. And up until then, it's a hypothesis. But what we can do is acknowledge that even in the realms of the teaching, which are a little confusing um, to us, say, rebirth, angels, different things, which sect to believe in, Mahayana, Theravada, Bodhisattva, Arahant, that if we look at the Buddha as a map maker, as we're, it's as if we have this map, and time and again, we wander through our lives, and we see that the map corresponds perfectly to the world which we're wandering for, through. There says there's trees and there's trees. And as the years pass, we begin to have this deep faith in the math, map maker. And even with those parts of the teaching which are a bit confusing, say mountains off on the horizon, is there a place for thinking, okay, I've never seen mountains before, not that high, but so much of this teaching is, has been right. This map seems accurate. And that's a measure of faith and confidence which is, which is meaningful. And that's enough. It's enough to go on this path with, having faith that grows in this map maker. And if others like me have practiced with these teachings for a time, you've seen that the words of the Buddha are profound at a level that is, I really think, un unseen. It is, um, I I've never encountered teachings as practical, as meaningful as them that are again and again right, and that when you look deeper into them, they just become clearer. That's the signal of truth, is that when you zoom in, it becomes more detailed, more clear, rather than vaguer, and that is certainly the case with the practice. But the Buddha gives us a means towards developing this. But what we have to also realize is it's such a radical shift when we begin to practice. It's the most potent comma of good we could possibly embark on. And the heart will shift radically. And oftentimes it takes quite a while for the thinking mind and especially our lives, external conditions to catch up. And often that can be really painful is you come back from retreat and there's the job, and that guy, and that woman, and, and people are constantly wondering uh, how to align their lives, because most of us aren't doing anything terrible, but we know there's still that subtle sense of suffering. Maybe we're not holding on a basketball, but there's still the ping pong ball that we're holding underwater, of like knowing we're not quite aligned with what it means to have encountered this path and to be mortal. And to have patience in those moments. Um, this is why the Buddha raised it patient endurance, is because often you just have to acknowledge that even if your head knows these things are suffering, even if your head knows you should give up the Netflix, the drinking, whatever, often the heart has to burn itself a few times before it gets the picture. And have patience as you deal with that. It's not easy, but it's how it goes. And there's a story of Ajahn Achilo. Um, he was at uh, Long Poor Nan's monastery, the monastery I ordained at, and he was just having a, a terrible day and just put his onksa, his little monk shirt over his head and just screamed into it and went up and found Ajahn at Long Poor Nan and said, when does it get any better? And Long Poor Nan said, in five years, it'll be a little better. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, Ajahn Sona also says, this practice will make you 50% happier in five years, and I think both are actually true. These are profound shifts, but just having patience. And also acknowledging that 
people often come back from a treat or something and really want to like make these radical changes in their lives and you do what you can but having compassion for ourselves we have a lot of inertia and often what you have to do is step out of your old patterning out of your situation into a completely different one and go back and forth and feel the burn a few times and then the heart will slowly adjust but this is important is that we only recognize patterns when we stepped away from them and have a vantage point so people often come and are like, I want to switch things in my life. I, I know I'm not living up to what the Dhamma means. And again and again, the advice I give is go to a monastery. Go to a monastery. They're for free. Go there. Because it's the great missing puzzle piece. And it's not like a retreat. It's different. It's like coming home. And you'll be in a place where all the patterns are suddenly radically different. And time and again, people go there. And within three days, deep insights bubble up and you have a vantage point. And then you come back into the, your life and it hurts a lot. And then you go back and forth and soon a deeper transformation occurs because you're having one foot in the transcendent and one foot in, in, in the world. And eventually you find that actually there's solid ground there for you in your life. It's also why I really encourage people to take a new posa today every week Turn off the uh, phone, uh, take eight precepts, um, have a vantage point, a reference point of silence in your week. Because if you do that, then you'll actually see the water you're swimming in better. And that's essential. So with these deeper questions, um, it's very useful to see how the Buddha saw the predicament we're in. And rather than kind of bludgeoning us over the head with a admonition to believe him, no matter what, what he said was, look, this is understandable, you feel doubt. But what he did is first, he constrained the realm of truth to what is deeply and meaningfully relevant right now. Where should you have your eyes? And that's based upon the goal of practice in Ancient Greek, the word for sin is hamartia, hamartia, which means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. So do you feel that sense of sin? Not as a Judeo-Christian, you know, uh, wound necessarily, but just that sense of being off. Are you missing the mark? The word dukkha um, also means, uh, du means wrong, and ka means axle. It's an axle of a wheel that's slightly off. And can you feel that sense of the life being a little unaligned. So the Buddha constrained truth to what's relevant right now in terms of progressing towards awakening. Then he gave us a tool belt of enough, enough things, and he steered us back to the body through the focus on breath meditation and these other things and the knowledge which resides there. And he says, wherever your faith comes from, acknowledge that it's, uh, it's that much. And eventually there is truth that's unshakable, and you'll know it when you get there. But for now, we hold ourselves in a humility and protect truth in that way. And, um, you know, in terms of things like uh, Theravada or Mahayana, you find that these roots only, these different traditions only become really confusing or doubt uh, initiating when you get into the far far reaches of their thought. Um, in the Theravada, there are many monks who and nuns that practice for uh, to as bodhisattvas, hoping to continue on in samsara for the sake of, uh, of benefiting beings. And similarly, in the, in the Mahayana, um, the teachings on the bodhisattva vows are almost always given in tandem with teachings on emptiness. And this really gives the opportunity at some point, yes, you've vowed to free all sentient beings, but there really may be a point where you realize all sentient beings are empty. And there might be awakening there as well. Um, the, uh, we asked uh, Ajahn Anand about one of the uh, famous bodhisattva characters, Avalokiteshvara, who they say has taken a vow to not become awakened until all beings are awakened. And Long Poor Anand said, he can change his mind. Um, <laughs> But there's always someone in that role. Um, but just to say, I've heard some, some people compare the 
being determining not to wake up until all beings have woken up as a dreaming man determining not to wake up until all his dream people have woken up. And who knows if that's true or not, but all to say that this only becomes a problem when you get way out there in these thought realms. And if you bring it back to what the Buddha focused on, what feels correct right now in your body, where is the Dhamma leading you, then I find there's not doubt. Um, I don't know exactly my path, but I know the power of these teachings. I know that these robes feel right to me. And I have faith in enough in this Dhamma to follow that. And so in a lot of sense, these different sectarian differences can fade if we come back to the Buddhist paradigm of truth and direction. Um, so next time you're all on a plane and someone tries to convert you, uh, just say, maybe. And uh, it's good to remember that there was a monk and a nun at Longpur Cha's monastery who um, disrobed and went off to become Christian monastery uh, missionaries. And Longpur Sumedho uh, came and told Ajahn Chah they'd left. And Ajahn Chah just said, maybe they're right. So we keep practicing, but with a, a twinkle in our eye and a sense of humility, levity, and a focus on what really matters, which is our practice here and now. Working on the mute. My question is, um, in a previous talk, you uh, discussed um, something about you wishing people had m something about not people taking bodhisattva vows too early um, and what I feel like I want to ask you is about I would like to request maybe not tonight or at some point if maybe we could have a teaching on dedication on like the the way that one makes dedications in the Buddhist practice and how that might be different from making a vow for example if I say may all beings attain Buddhahood, like may you attain the happiness of Buddhahood, wouldn't that be the highest happiness? Like, it's not, it's up to you to become a Buddha, but if I wish you, may you become a Buddha, that's really me saying, may you have what's the highest happiness in our tradition. So I think what was would be more um, beneficial is just maybe we can get a teaching on how vows and dedications work so that we can be more informed with the dedications and vows that we make. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, the, um, just to address a little bit of it now, and perhaps there will be a chance for a longer teaching at some point, but um, uh, dedication is a really, is very much in the tradition, which is where you, you dedicate the goodness of your life and your practice to, to beings. And remember that this is a, a profound gift you give people by cleansing your heart. Um, and it, it really, makes you remember that this practice isn't just for, for us. Uh, Ajahn Sumedho was feeling really fiery one day and went up to Ajahn Shah and said, I'm done like messing around. I'm just going to become enlightened as fast as I can. And Longpur Cha just looked at him and said, what about the rest of us, Ajahn Sumedho? <laughs> and uh, so I think, you know, this dedication is an important, important way of conceiving of things. The bodhisattva vows are something often given and taken in some of the Mahayana circles where you basically make a, an aditana, a determination. I will not become awakened. Being all, beings are numberless. I vow to free them all, etc. cetera. And um, it's a beautiful aspiration in what it does to the heart, but to give it as a firm vow before people know what they're agreeing to and have just begun in the practice because it's kind of sounds good, I think it doesn't honor the vow or the person. And, and I think it should be given more lightly, uh, or sorry, not lightly, uh, carefully. Um, I have heard a great teach, teaching on it. Um, one Zen master was asked by a student, like, how do we fulfill these vows? And the Zen master said, just add the phrase from myself to the end of each one. I vow to free all beings from myself. <laughs> ah. And I always like that. That's not <laughs> Mahayana doctrine. It's just a great pithy saying as well so mm. yeah. thank you Joseph yeah sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. hello okay <laughs> so uh, something that was coming up for me both on retreat and this last week in my practice and I think is related to some of what you're saying is sometimes there's this like clearly big emotion that's blocking me from 
feeling my breath, for example. And then I can kind of work with that and then um, get back to my practice. But other times, like I was noticing this week, it just, um, something felt like just a little bit off. And I was able to figure it out because <laughs> with this example, because I just actually, my mind just felt a little sad because it just wanted to meditate. Um, but I'm curious about some ways to kind of work with emotions like that when I'm not, it's not like clear right away what it, what's within that and kind of how to investigate that off of, perhaps off of the cushion. Yeah, good question. Um, I think when you're on, do you have more? Okay. I mean, I think when you're on the cushion, um, one thing is to acknowledge when your emotional bodies just become a whole lot bigger than your physical body, you know, and it's kind of this awkward, clumsy, gigantic thing that you're, a and I think there's really a place when it's like that to stop trying to bring to the breath constantly and just let your mind expand and give that emotional creature a, a chance to to feel its shape and and to feel its shape as well you know and, and to allow it to kind of breathe and I think we can sometimes really constrict and agitate those emotional states by by stubbornly sticking to an object when when the object needs to be the the emotional state itself and I think one useful way of doing that is asking what's here right now or expanding awareness just to ha be broader and hold this large state um, but as to working and investigating it off the cushion uh, I think you know there's just the being patient as you kind of experiment over a period of time like I had a similar thing where a lot of times in the afternoons I'd feel sad until I realized it was just my mind wanting to meditate and pulling in and if I just closed my eyes it was like oh that's that's what I needed and this is odd long time Mahabua, a really famous teacher said we want this practice to be like a staircase up a mountain but it's much more like we're kind of scrambling up a mountain grabbing onto bits of grass here and there you know and just we're just stumbling uh, around and just be patient with being at an impasse and just systematically try different things um, but I think writing it out is really helpful I think asking yourself right when you wake up a question like what what's that about you have access to your subconscious, which is really useful right then, right when you wake up. Um, one thing I forgot to speak about in the Kalama Sutta is the Buddha goes on to say, think of, uh, bring to mind the Brahma Vihar's states of boundless you know, loving kindness. And I think within that wide space, sometimes things that would be unwilling to speak, speak. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are all kind of ideas, but I, I, yeah, it can take some time. And talking it out with people, um, this is helpful too, I suppose. If others have other ideas, then please. But yeah. Um, and we were just speaking about that this this morning. But uh, Venerable Tupton Chodron had one nun at her monastery who was going through a lot of difficulty, and she had her make a a big paper mache monster of the thing, her anger. And after she'd made it, uh, Venerable Chodron said, "Does how does that feel to have out of you?" So I think sometimes really like shaping something and articulating it is how we, we tame it. Um, and I think sometimes that has to be done through art uh, for the deeper strata of sort of this union, deeper strata of us. Sometimes that helps. So, okay, good, this works. Um, uh, so I'm kind of new to all of this. Um, what would you recommend for getting started with meditation and kind of incorporating it into your life? Have you uh, done a retreat yet or um, have downloaded an app or listened to any specific talks, if I could ask? I have been listening to the talks of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia for a few months. Ajahn Brahm, okay, great. And uh, yeah, they're they're wonderful. Um, I would really try to cultivate a 20 minute a day practice at at, at the least um, in the morning if that's most helpful. Um, there's usually sea changes in people's lives around 20 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, and an hour and a half a day. Something really shifts around those those markers. 
20 minutes is, is a good starting point and it will make a huge difference over time. Um, so I'd say uh, beginning with, um, if you, there's a website called dhammatalks.org, which is Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn Tanisaro. His breath instructions are amazing and he has a book called Keeping the Breath in Mind and with each and every breath, which are really helpful breath meditation and all of his meditations, they're sort of 15 minute talks, so many of them are aimed around that. So that's a really good like starting playlist that you can rely on and there's, there's a lot of talks there. Um, I would also say you can get an app if that's useful. Insight Meditation Timer has a lot of teachers. It also has Russell Brand, but you know, it has normal meditation teachers too. <laughs> so that's helpful. Um, uh, Headspace is an app and, and you can come up and I can write these down as well. Um, but I would also say if you, it, it can kind of be hard to jumpstart a practice. It's sort of like starting a lawnmower or like when your you know, parent tried to teach you to saw a piece of wood and it keeps getting stuck and embarrasses you. Like, sometimes it's useful to jump full in and just go to a, there's these 10-day Goinka retreats, Vipassana retreats, um, that are free. And uh, there's a center nearby in, in Onalaska. And if you go to one of those 10 days, you'll come out with a practice. And the same goes, I'd say, for a, a monastery, is if you can get away to a Bayagiri, and Birkin's gonna be opening soon, too. A Bayagiri's a monastery in California, and Birkin's up north. Um, that'll, you'll leave with a practice. But I'd say just, getting those 20 minutes a day, uh, making sure you got some loving kindness in there, um, keep coming to community. Um, Sims is a great resource, Seattle Insight Meditation Society. And come up to me after the talk and I'll just write all this down. <laughs> so if that's helpful, yeah. And join our Discord because if you ask questions there, people will, will chime in a lot. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom there, yeah. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I think we can call it good, unless Joey's got one. Thank you for the talk, Ajahn. Um, I've uh, <coughs> been curious about this idea, uh, I guess in the, in the realm of doubt and, and also uh, truth and kind of trying to find one's grounding in the practice, both in sort of the short term and also in the long term. And uh, this, uh, this Dhamma talk, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a Dhamma talk by uh, Ajahn Sundara. And <coughs> at, the, uh, at the end of it, she said, she was like, okay, if, I, if, you, if you walk away with one thing at the end of this, what I want you to know is never trust your mind. And it was one of these things that at first I was like, wow, this is so great. And then it was, it became really disorienting. I was like, oh man, uh, <laughs> how do I make any decision at all, right? And, um, and uh, I guess what I was going to ask is, you know, what I, what I ended up kind of walking away with this from was, uh, was this idea of, kind of this beauty in letting go of the long game and just being in this like moment to moment experience. And, uh, but also valuing that like long, <coughs> that long path that we can take too, right? Like, like sometimes it's easy to <coughs> get into that state of like looking far in the future and being like, oh yes. And then realizing how baseless like getting to that point can be, you know, it's like, I'm basing this on all these like, you know, imaginations that I've created and suddenly I'm supposed to get to this point. And so I, I, I guess I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on like this balance between, you know, living in this moment to moment, kind of trying to stay as much in the present as possible and then also trying to develop uh, aspirations uh, on the horizon that are meaningful. So. Yeah, great, great question. Um, Ajahn Tanisar just has the good metaphor of when you're driving in the car towards a mountain, like you don't want to always be looking at the mountain because you'll drive off the road. 
but you do want to look at the mountain every now and again to make sure it's not in your rear view mirror, you know? So it's important to acknowledge we have a goal, but yeah, like most of your attention should be right, right here. Um, as to discerning what the right path is right now and not trusting the mind, um, there's several reasons for the ordering of the Four Noble Truths to comprehend suffering, let go of craving, realize peace, develop the path to that peace. But one helpful reflection in that ordering, I find, is that peace comes before the path. And often we have to wait until those moments of calm and lucidity before we can see what's next. To try to, when the mind's really wild and when doubt's really strong, there's no way past doubt through doubt. Um, you just know it as doubt. And this can really hamstring moderns uh, because you can really buy into it as a meditation kind of like, I'm just really trying to figure this out, but you just are going in circles. Um, and yeah, so waiting until you have a moment of calm and then making the decision from there and acknowledging that when the mind is wild, you're not going to get the clarity you want, so stop trying. Um, and uh, if you do that, being willing to be f strong enough to put a flag in those moments like, I remember after being a monk for a few years, I, I knew it was what I wanted to do. But, you know, it's sometimes you think it'd be nice to have dinner or go play StarCraft or something. I don't know, you know. And, and uh, there was a day where I said, like, I know my best self understands what I'm, that I want to live this way. And so I'm just going to, I'm making the determination. This is what I'm going to do. And so if you have those moments of clarity, you trust make a determination, plant a flag in it. I'm, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to, you know, hang out with this person anymore. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm going to go to the monastery this often. I'm going to determine to meditate this many days or this many hours a day or this many minutes a day. And, and then you're steering your life by the moments that are trustworthy, the moments of Nirodha, Third Noble Truth. Um, Um, I think we have to stop. Yes, okay. Um, one other caveat. Uh, the talk uh, last week on culture war pacifism, uh, which any talk I get to reference Dolly Parton's a win in my book, um, but I just want to make very clear that uh, I think there really is a place for social change and for social and uh, discussion of those important issues. Um, what I think I was really pointing to was the aspect of kind of feeding off of the news cycle and conflating action with checking the iPhone 30 times a day. And uh, once again, there is this website, karunanews.org, with men adopting puppies, and uh, it's just all the good news, so you should all bookmark that as soon as you can.